The Comics Course is an offering of the lectures from Miskatonic University's Literature 209, Graphical Literature and Society and History, offered as a publicly available podcast. Welcome back. Class is in session. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. No, it is not karaoke night. It is Ramadan. I am your ever gestating Professor Hamby, awaiting my ascension to godhood, and here with me, my T.A. Rowan, who I'm pretty sure will establish the anti-Orthodox clergy to oppose me if I ever do. I don't know what you mean. Say hello, Rowan. Hello, Rowan. So, we're going to do a indulgent lecture today. Ooh. Do you know what I mean by indulgent? And I don't mean I'm forgiving people's sins. Um, one of the popes said that was okay, but it turned out he wasn't the pope of the Catholic Church. And there was a holy war, and it, it all got very ugly. And I'm apparently not allowed to go back to Spain for a little while. Have we even confirmed if the pope is a human yet or not? The I current heard, one? Yeah, I've heard there's been some confusion with him being an alien, a lizard, a robot. Well, there was a lizard man pope at one point, but everybody actually liked him, so they just kind of ignored it. Okay, good to know. Current one, I'm not sure. Okay, still not clear consensus. On there that. have been other groups, however, that have claimed to be the true Catholic Church. Uh, one of them still exists in Spain to this day. Huh, yep. interesting. Anyway, I'm being flippant and weird. So, let's jump into Neil Gaiman's Sandman. Sandman is what we've been talking about for a while. Mm -hmm. And it's easiest to talk about when it's a complete story arc. Mm -hmm. But there have been a number of standalone stories that we've talked about. And fables and reflections or distant mirrors. When we did the first chunk of stories for distant mirrors, they were a collection of stories that talked about ruling and kingdoms in relationship to dreams in various ways. We had the Emperor Augustus of Rome, who ended up uh, visited by Morpheus and getting advice from Terminus, the god of boundaries, and he essentially set up the death of Rome. Ooh, okay. Then we had the Emperor Norden I of the United States mm -hmm. and his relationship to dreams and his kingdom, mm -hmm. right? And... What was the other story? Help me out. I'm, I'm testing you. This is a quiz. It's a quiz. Kingdoms? Uh, kingdoms? May something that gay showed us Orpheus for the first time? Thermidor. Oh. And, of course, Citizen Robespierre's New Republic falls apart with his death shortly after the events of Thermidor. Oh. So, Because he envisioned this future world of pure reason, mm. and all he had to do was to get rid of the magic. Which, good luck with that when magic is in people's dreams. Very reasonable. So this is the last part mm -hmm. of Distant Mirrors, Ramadan. Ramadan. Are you familiar with Ramadan? Is it like an old, I want to say, Greek story about the end of the world? You're not even close. Okay. Never mind, though. Ramadan is a season okay. in the lunar calendar. It roughly is usually around our March-April. Mm. This year it's sort of half in March, half in April. Mm. And it is a season recognized in the Muslim traditions mm. where during the day... They don't eat food, and they don't indulge in anything, and they basically fast each day and eat at night. Oh, huh, interesting. With some exceptions for medical issues, you know, don't get dehydrated and collapse, that kind of stuff. Well, all religions have their ifs, ifs and buts. Right. It's supposed to be about fasting and focusing on your piety towards God, not getting yourself killed. Yeah, you can't worship if you're dead. And... The question is valid. Why wasn't this with the other distant mirrors? Good question. Sounds like it fits in. 
Well, this was issue 50 of Sandman. Mm -hmm. Neil Gaiman wanted to wait and use it for issue 50 as a big, spectacular, oh my god, we hit 50 issues thing. Hmm. And got art from Craig P. Russell, written by Neil Gaiman, of course. And this is my single favorite issue of Sandman. And no small part of it is the art and the themes. Now, this is going back to Mythic Arabia. And I have always adored the Arabian Nights. Yeah, you love those. Yes. And even in the beginning, we open up with Craig P. Russell having created this beautiful piece of geometric art, Mm -hmm. which is very much a part of the Islamic artistic tradition. Mm -hmm. And it says, in this beautiful script, In the name of Allah, the compassionate, the all-merciful, I tell my tale, for there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. And then we open into these pages of just succulent art, and the colors just jump out at you. And, I mean, Craig Russell is a master of understatement. When he draws a bunch of harem women sitting around on these decadent pillows it's just a few lines but he makes those lines look like pure erotic art Mm -hmm. but it's understated it's not about giving a bunch of detail it's about invoking the imagination of these soft curves i think it's brilliant Mm -hmm. so to read a little bit from these first two pages because they set the tone Know then that this is a tale of Baghdad, the heavenly city, the jewel of Arabia, and that this was in the time of Harun al-Rashid, king of kings, prince of the faithful. There was no court that was like to Harun al-Rashid's, for he had gathered to him all manner of great men from all corners of the world. There were sages and wise men and alchemists, geographers and geomancers, mathematicians and astronomers, translators and archivists, Juris, grammarians, Cadiz, and scribes. A Cadi being a, a a judge of religious law. Oh, I know. Thank you. In his court were the greatest teachers of the Hebrews, who were the first of the three people of the books, and the greatest monks of the pale Christians, a dirty folk who will not bathe and who venerate the dried dung of their leader, whom they call the Pope. <laughs> And as you must realize, he had with him the greatest scholars of the Quran and the word of Allah as revealed to his prophet Muhammad 180 years before. Thus his palace was the palace of wisdom. There were women in his harem, concubines from every land, infidile, infaithful, with skins white as the desert, skins as brown as the mountains, seen at evening, skins yellow as smoke, skins black as obsidian all of them adept in the arts of pleasure. There were many beautiful boys, their chins still hairless, their eyes wanton and lustful, savory as apricots plucked in the dew. Thus was his palace the palace of pleasure. And he goes on to explain how his palace has all these amazing wonders, half-breed people with animal heads, machines that can sing songs, Uh, Ancient sorcerers who know the secrets of angels to jinn and men. And so he just has the most amazing kingdom in all the world. For these were the days of wonder. But all of this description ends with, But Harun al-Rashid was troubled in his soul. Hmm. And at these times when the darkness would descend on his brows, He would go out at night into the city of Baghdad, taking with him only his friend and vizier, and then his executioner. And then they tell in brief here, in just a few panels, some of the legendary stories of the Arabian Nights Mm -hmm. and how they took place in the city. Mm -hmm. So this is the city of the Harun al-Rashid mentioned in the Arabian Nights. And this is a city with genies and all these things. And I don't know, maybe the art doesn't speak to you like it does to me, but I adore this art. I love the colors. 
and it's minimal while being rich. Mm-hmm. But Rashid is bothered. Mm. He asks his vizier, look at our city. Is it not wonderful? Will there ever be another like it? Well, if Allah wills it. Ah, but the will of Allah is not meant for man to know. Leave me. And so he goes down into the deepest dungeons of his palace, taking a key that only he has. He goes down what seem like an infinite number of steps, passing past the harems, passing past the torture chambers, passing past where men have been thrown to grow old and die in the dark, until he finds a door with a very special lock that can be only opened by his key. He walks through hallways with ghosts and demons. He walks further into the earth. He has to crawl through places that he can't stand in. He has to walk through halls of fire, Halls filled with gems bigger than him. Rooms hung with enchanted swords. Rooms that contain nothing but magical eggs. Until he reaches a door of fire. He goes through the door of fire and he picks up a glass ball resting on a satin pillow. And he climbs up back through. And he comes to the highest place he can stand on his tower and he says I am the caliph of Baghdad as one king to another I call to you king of dreams lord of the sleeping are you there I demand that you present yourself to me and he goes on to say when Morpheus doesn't appear in my hands I hold the globe of Solomon bin Dayal king of the Hebrews it was in this globe near the end of his life that he imprisoned 9,009 ifrits to jinn and demons. They were the darkest and greatest spirits. One by one he bound them and sealed them nearly 2,000 years ago. And basically he says, either you show up or I break this globe and let them all back out in the world. Mm. And so he takes the globe and throws it. However, it is caught by Morpheus. You have called me, and I have come. Are you then the Lord of Sleep, the Prince of Stories? He goes on. You know whom you have called, Harun al-Rashid. And Rashid calls for wine. He says, but Morpheus says, This is the month of Ramadan, O king, when the faithful fast from dawn until sunset. And has not this prophet spoken against wine? Are you of the faith? I am of all faiths. So he takes the globe. He is not amused at being summoned. (laughs) He points out to Rashid, it is unwise to summon things you cannot dismiss. You know, why do people keep summoning Morpheus? He's never happy to be interrupted. Right. It never goes well. Look. When you're on your 20,000th re-listen of the Smiths. <laughs> Just leave the man alone. Right. So Rashid goes to take Morpheus on a tour of the city. And it's amazing. I mean, look at the bazaar. Oh, that's gorgeous. It's just, I mean, everything from birds to the most succulent foods to literal cat girls. Mm-hmm. I know a few people that would love the opportunity to buy a cat girl. Mm. They're probably the same people that shouldn't be allowed to buy one. Um, hot tech. I don't think anyone should be able to buy people, but that's just me. I was assuming non-sentience here. Oh, sure. Yeah, definitely don't allow them. So, uh, Rashid goes to buy grapes. And he has the most elaborate debate with the grape seller over the grapes. Because everything is amazing here, right? Mm -hmm. And so he has this conversation with Morpheus and says, Look around you, Dream King. What do you see? I see a remarkable place. Indeed, it is a land of miracles. Will you buy it from me? Morpheus explains he has no interest in a mortal kingdom. And Rashid explains 
you misunderstand me. This is the greatest city. Maybe the greatest city that will ever be. It is perfect. But I know it will fade. I've seen the world. Even the greatest things are consumed by sand eventually. Then why are you trying to get him to take it? Because in dreams, maybe it could survive forever. Mm. And Morpheus says, after a fashion, I can take it into dreams. He says, all you need to do is tell your people. They follow you, after all, and yours is the dream. Now, this is not the first time we've seen the theme Mm. of all the people dreaming together changing reality. That was in the Tale of a Thousand Cats as well. Yeah. Where if the cats all dream together, they would become the... Dominant species again. Mm -hmm. And not rewrite time, but change things so they had never been. Yeah. And here we see this great symbolism as Rashid talks to the people. He convinces them to follow him into dreams and says that now Baghdad is Morpheus's forever, providing that as long as mankind lasts, our world is not forgotten. And then as he says this, we see the flying carpet that he took Morpheus on out to the bazaar, flying high overhead, and then it fumbles down and falls into the dust. And we see Rashid sleeping on a on some sort of just detrius, maybe the detrius of that rug, in the marketplace. And we see Baghdad, as you would imagine it in the Middle Ages of the mortal world now, and one of the palace guards has come out to take him back to the palace. Mm -hmm. And we see Morpheus standing to the side with a beautiful city in a bottle. Mm -hmm. The city of Baghdad. Time has now been rewritten so that the fabulous Baghdad with the magic and the genies and the Ifrit never happened in the mortal world, but lives on in dreams. Mm. So here is not a king whose kingdom exists only in his mind, as it did for Emperor Norden. Mm -hmm. It's not a king who's killing his kingdom, as Augustus did. It's not a king who misunderstands the people, as Robespierre did. Here we have a king who understands his people and is making sure his kingdom will live forever. Mm-hmm. Simply in dreams. And the tale is being told, we see in the very last page, by an older man to a crippled young child. And all of this is taken in the context of uh, the U.S. war, where we attacked Baghdad. Mm-hmm. And now it's a desolate place that people are barely surviving in, uh, even though mythical Baghdad lives on in dreams. Mm -hmm. So this is a very short episode. There's not a lot of plot to talk about, not a lot of symbolism, but I still think it's an interesting companion to Distant Mirrors, and I personally love the theme of the city living on through eternity in stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you think? And may I note that we've seen the bottle before. Do you remember when Morph when Aziel pissed off Morpheus back in Season of Mists? Mm-hmm. And so Morpheus surrounded him into a globe and put him in a chest, mm-hmm. and there was a city in a bottle in the chest. Oh yeah, you mentioned that and said that will come up later. Yep, this is it. This is this is the later. <laughs> this is the later. And there's one thing here in the back of this edition that I wanted to show you. Mm-hmm. Not the alternate covers, although they're cool. Mm -hmm. Not the chibi endless, although they're kind of cool too. Mm -hmm. Not the contributor's notes, which are very tongue-in-cheek bullshit. (laughs) (laughs) But the original script for Ramadan. There was a different script used? No, but we get to see here the script, how it was actually written. Oh. These are Neil Gaiman's script and then his rough sketches that were done for what the pages should look, have in them. Yeah, because for, for the artist to work with. Mm-hmm. Although I think these pages may not have been Gaiman's. These pages may have been the initial uh, sketches done by Craig Russell that he sent to Gaiman for, do I have the basic blocking right? I think so, because those look like basic sketch shapes mm-hmm. that- even I recognize. Yeah. And don't seem to be from someone who doesn't know how to draw. 
I mean, it may be Gaiman knows how to draw. I don't know. But I thought you might find that interesting mm -hmm. with your artistic interests. Mm -hmm. And for anyone else who's interested in seeing that, that is Sandman, the Deluxe Edition, Volume 3. And next one we pick up on Sandman will be on Volume 4. Woo! I'm excited. I am too. And with that, class is no longer in session. Class is dismissed, but if you need to talk to the professor, listen on. My link tree is at l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e forward slash prof hamby. That is p-r-o-f-h-a-m-b-y. That has all the places that I post announcements at about new episodes, including the huge variety of podcasting services and YouTube that I drop them on. Additionally, I actually spend a little bit of personal time on a couple of networks, specifically Twitter, that's pr at Prof Hamby, P-R-O-F-H-A-M-B-Y, and on Tumblr, where the blog is called simply Comics Course. And I also, for some of my more narrative cast episodes, also post the transcriptions or notes from my podcasts. I'll see you around, and if you want to contact me, DMs are always open.